part two of my interview with Oren Klopper. We talk about his M&A strategy, what kind of MSP he'd start today, and what he sees about in the future. This is a bonus episode of The Business of Tech. So tell me a little bit about the program, because you've, you've clearly made intentional choices in investing in culture. Yes. <laughs> like that, you, yes. You, that doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. So, so, so tell me about the, the program and the, and the choices you've made and the programs you're running. Yeah, sure. So I suppose the key program within the aspirations of our culture, and I always use the word aspiration because it's never arrived. There's some years where it's, you feel like it's, you're shooting the lights out and other years we're investing so much and it just seems like there's so many problems. Uh, so we're in a really good, good phase right now. Uh, so it, to give you a bit of context, I realized pretty early on, Dave, that if we were going to scale and build something significant, we needed a culture that encouraged being people to be balanced. And we saw that, I saw that actually an incident in 2004 with one of our team, where he was sitting in front of a server and he had just burnt out and he wasn't typing and he wasn't even talking. And this is just, he's with us still today. He's just an amazing guy. Uh, he's in our, he's in our, our team in, in Manhattan. And I came across a, a, a methodology on goal setting and realized if, uh, you know, so I've always, you know, to, to be candid, I don't think I'm particularly gifted or talented of anything. And, uh, I'm not bad. I think I, you know, I have some natural strengths and skills, but I'm not an Elon Musk or a, these guys are just genius. So I found comfort in my life in the idea that if I know what I want and I work very hard at, at it and I'm disciplined and I pursue that, in time I will achieve it. So then I found a framework that matched that thinking. And, uh, and, and then in 2007, I was at, um, I was at a program at MIT where uh, one of the lecturers, a guy called Cameron Herald, mentioned a book called The Dream Manager. And I'd also read uh, the fo the following year. I did uh, an engagement at um, at Stanford with Simon Sinek, where he facilitated a group I was involved in. And it just the pieces started to fall in fall into place for me. We needed to be purpose driven. Our people needed to feel just coming to work. There was a purpose. The first layer of purpose is actually being there for your people and supporting them. And so. In a nutshell, what is our what is our culture? What is that key beams program pillar of our culture? Um, you do something called a dream book, which is very simply your top ten personal goals and dreams visualized. Then you get put into a dream group, which is a group of anywhere between six to twelve people. You meet once a month in work time, and it becomes uh, an inner circle for you to support each other. And talk about the challenges and the wins that you're having in your life. So that's a dream group. And uh, yeah, so we redo the dream dream books every year. And uh, it really, I mean, sometimes people leave because of the dreams program because they realize that this is not what they really want to do with their life. And then, you know, and then I'll get an email from them or a, or a, or a text saying, or, you know, I, I've achieved this. Uh, it was in my dream book in which just, it just feels really, really good. Uh, and, you know, just to conclude on this point, there's something, Dave, that happens when we share with, with other people what we really want in our lives in an authentic way. There's something in the human spirit that, that connects us. I want to see that person achieve that. So that's the essence of really what we try to create in the, in the Dreams program. And you're pretty, I mean, you're pretty forward with this. I'll, I'll give listeners insight. You shared yours with me as a prep yes. for the, you know, prep for this. So is, is that like part of the organization that this is very much like everyone sharing that discussion very much as part of, I'll say, daily life at the organization, even across locations? How's that work? Yes. So, so there is a, an aspiration of vulnerability because I think some of the greatest human connections happen when we're, when we're vulnerable with each other. Uh, there's a personality profile dynamic as far as an introvert and, uh, and an extrovert. So, uh, I don't think uh, everybody does it maybe at the level that I do. Uh, I feel very comfortable with that. I've, I've always, I've, I've always, I haven't always been like that, but I've grown into that. And so we have a piece of the program, which is called a dream connect, where we encourage you 
to connect with someone you don't work with at all. And like, so we, we've got people in Poland, we've got people in Peru, we've got people in New Jersey, we've got people in, in, in New York City, we've got people in, down in Durban, in South Africa. And uh, we're saying to them, so, so for instance, we've got a lady in our marketing team in Peru. So I, we're saying, you know, we've got developers in Poland, connect, do a dream connect and share your dream book or don't even share your dream book if you don't want, just have a chat, find out. And, and it is amazing to see some of the things that come out of that, some of the learnings and the connections. Now, I'm going to pivot a little bit because I feel like culture is actually related to this next topic. You've been very focused on M&A activity. Yes. Um, but, if you, but anybody that's done all the reading on this knows that like, ultimately like the hardest thing is culture. And it would feel like in an M&A, and it would feel like you've set such standards around culture. How are you approaching that in the M&A process to maintain that? Yeah, it's unbelievably complicated. Um, yeah, we don't we don't have a clear formula, you know. Because I always think to myself, in that space of culture, you know, when you think about business and strategy and performance measurements and all these things, are like you can you can measure it, you can drive it, you can. But culture is more of a community building dynamic. You know, Peter Block wrote a book called Community, which I think captures the dynamic of culture uh, really, really well. So we try our best when we're considering an organization as an acquisition, or we actually position it as partnering because we want to keep the key leaders. And, uh, it, you know, so we're trying to understand and get insight into the culture, but any good leader and entrepreneur, you shouldn't let an, a potential acquirer go and talk to all your people because you know, it's just going to create all sorts of uncertainty and what happens if the deal falls over and that. So it's been, it's been very challenging. Uh, where we cannot get access to a little bit of, uh, of a deeper or broader team. And then we're hoping that what we're experiencing with those leaders is an indication of what is actually transpiring and happening in that, in that business. Uh, so we, it is one of those things, because when we acquire a business, we do not want to break the magic there. We want to do whatever we can to protect it. And every single one of them has their own unique DNA. And so that is what we're trying to balance. And wherever we can get that fit up front right in that alignment, uh, that's great. And, you know, so, so I'll give you an example. We closed the deal last year and um, in December. And the CEO of that business, this is an absolutely amazing human, sent me his dream book in February. So we don't even expect in the first year that you that you have to do anything from the Jewish program. Nothing. He he chose on his, on his uh, out of his own. He just wanted to send it to me. The people the the key connection to an organization is the relationship those people have with their line manager. So we got out of our way to protect and hold on to the key leaders and managers in the business. And we think if we can do that, we're able to protect that culture and over time merge and and and, and grow the culture together. So it's, I think you've given away pieces of my, my next question, but I want to make sure that I'm hearing it right. Because I was going to say, like, what is your, your M&A strategy? It sounds like it's selectively choosing organizations that match, where culture and the leadership is sort of the number one. You're probably also measuring it based on other criteria. Help fill in that framework for me. What sure. is the, the kind of central thesis of your M&A strategy? The core of our, our, uh, our acquisitive growth is focused on other MSPs. We do have a, a smaller part, which is different skill sets and technologies. Uh, but the core is MSPs. We want, it, hypothetically, there are three key leaders. We want at least, at least one, ideally two, or all of them, to stay on for the next phase of the journey. Uh, from a size perspective, probably anywhere from a three to an eight million dollar revenue is is our sort of uh, sweet spot that we're targeting. Uh, and if you were to look at, it's it's definitely leaders, Dave, that 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 really value their people. Which you could say you say that's all businesses, but it's not always the case. It's not all businesses. That's a clear indicator, a clear indicator for us. All right. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask the question that all my listeners always ask about. Tell me how you're valuing these businesses. Oh, for sure. Uh, we look at various elements. We look at the, the amount of annuity. 
we look at the the length and tenure of customer relationships, uh, their retention of those customers, their growth, and uh, we look at the tenure of their people, how long the people have been there. We look at what services they're delivering, and obviously the profitability is also an important an important piece, and. I mean, the, the, the valuation multiples are anywhere from five to to probably being realistic, uh, eight uh, in this space for the size of business. Uh, and that's a multiple of EBITDA, and it's generally an adjusted EBITDA. You kind of have your base EBITDA. So let's assume it's an, uh, uh, an $8 million revenue business. Let's say it's a $5 million revenue business. And the, the unadjusted EBITDA, is that's really your profit earnings before interest tax and depreciation is let's just say for a simple numbers is five hundred thousand dollars and then you go in and you have a look there might be some expenses which are extraordinary and some spend which you can justifiably with reason adjust out and now the profit goes up to let's say seven hundred thousand dollars so an example of that could be um well, let me tell you what's not an example where you take your salary out. <laughs> That's what a lot of entrepreneurs love to do. Yeah, no, just take it out. Well, we want you around. You must at least earn what you're earning now. So that is not for us an adjustment as an example. And so, so adjustments could be, um, you know, I think entrepreneurs, Dave, do expense things through the business. So that's, that's a, that could mm -hmm. be a typical category. Um, and there could be adjustments where it actually adjusts down uh as well and that figure then we generally look at at the adjustments and say are they fair and then let's assume it's a, a five times ebitda we would say five five times seven hundred thousand dollars equals three and a half million dollars okay got it that that gives people a lot of of pieces to work with as they're thinking about the valuation. Now, I know that I'm going to ask the other one that I know listeners are always dying to know, and you alluded to a piece of this. So I want to, want to, want to get some understanding of it. You mentioned earlier that you have some developers, right? So that, that implies you're not just necessarily taking other people's technology, but you're actually either integrating pieces in custom ways or building your own. Yes. Give me, give us just a little bit of an insight into, into your technical stack for the, for the organization. Yeah, sure. So I think particularly within our Innovate offering, there are that's where some of the highest technical skill, particularly around low code development and even some code coding that is that is happening. So that is particularly around the Microsoft uh, Power Platform framework. And then we're getting into Microsoft.net and and some of those other technologies. So we have uh, five advanced specializations and uh, we're deep in Azure. So deep, deep. So from an architect and a project perspective, we have deep uh, Microsoft Azure skills, deep Microsoft security skills, and uh, right the way through to entry-level desktop or, or, or service desk engineers uh, that are doing the really sort of base-level frontline support. We don't do any of the accounting or CRM solutions, uh, so we don't have any of those, those skill sets. What do you run your business on? So we run, uh, so we use uh, ConnectWise is, uh, is, is the one technology set that we use. Uh, we use Enable from a monitoring and alerting uh, perspective. And uh, we use quite a lot of um, automation uh, technologies around how we're quoting, quote works, uh, tools and technologies like that. Um, those are kind of the core uh, tools that we use, but we've written some of our own software. So we have a very deep belief in performance measurement and what you measure is what you get. So we wrote our own balance scorecard or slash performance measurement system where each month, and quite a lot of this is automated, uh, your performance is measured from me right the way through to, uh, you know, sort of an entry level uh, technician. And uh, so that is a, a technology set that we that we use extensively. That I also believe is one of our one of our competitive advantages. Okay, and it's, it sounds like it would be because it's also very much linked to your investment in culture. <laughs> so so yes. it would be like the, the the two are the two are very much linked. 
we're g- let's let's have a little bit of fun here. I'm gonna we're gonna play a bit of a thought exercise because I'm I always like to ask other owners about this space. I've got my own version of it. It's of course on YouTube, uh, but I want to hear yours. So, if you were launching an MSP today, you know, you're 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 young, you're, you're young again, you're the young entrepreneur uh, when you were starting out, but you have all the knowledge that you have now. It's just now, as opposed to when you launched it, you know, before in this current marketplace, if you were starting an MSP today, what would that look like? I would, I would start, uh, I, w- I would start it around the innovate offering that we have that I described. I would make that the core and I would always lead uh, with that because, and then I would, I would backfill the other, the other requirements. I would, I think AI and machine learning carries so, so much opportunity. And if, if, if you're any of the listeners ever read any of the books in that space, it's, you know, it feels like like heavy lifting in the beginning and you're literally up to 99%. It feels like you're not seeing any return. Like it, and then suddenly it just tips. And we, we, we leveraged it and we continue to leverage it, but we're not yet at that tipping point. And I think some of that is legacy. Whereas I think if you can design it clean from the beginning, yeah, so hypothetically I could go and just start from the beginning. You could build those fundamentals deeply into the way your service is designed, the way it's structured, the way customers reach out to you, the way they communicate with you. I think there is, you know, if you, you know, we spoke about disruption uh, earlier. I think, I think that tipping point is, is, I don't know. I reckon it's, it's coming and it's going to have a big, big, big impact on this space. That's you're thinking in mine are alike. It's why I'm actually actually performing the question because I think the follow on bit is is so isn't that the competitor of the future is the young twenty or thirty something right now who's thinking about entering this space that that doesn't have the legacy? Like, isn't that the competitor of the future? <laughs> isn't that who we're going to be competing against? Yeah, it it it, it, pro- it probably will. And I've come across many organizations that talk this. And, uh, I mean, one, and I'll tell you one, I don't want to mention their name to, to talk them down or anything. I got so excited. Let me tell you now, Dave, this was, this was a sure. good few years ago. This was like 20, it was 2018. And they were basically saying they've built this machine learning engine that will automatically leveraging AI, be able to predict and actually solve the problem. So I went through meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. And then eventually, so I just couldn't get to a tangible ROI that there was actually, they could deliver. So eventually what I did is I gave them my financials. I said, here are our financials. If you want any more detail in any line item, just ask me. You come back to me with the business case. And if you can show me a business case and commit to that, I will sign up immediately. And it was going to be a massive investment, the most significant investment we've ever made in a, in, and fundamentally changing our business model. And I tell you what makes this space harder than, let's take, for instance, let's assume Citibank has a 100,000 user environment. In the heterogeneous nature of the SMB space makes it a lot harder to do this. So I do believe it's going to come. And the, the, the technology will eventually be at a place where, uh, where it will tip, but it's not, it's, it's not there yet. It's not there yet. What's next? Like, what are you, what are you thinking about next for, for the org, for yourself? What's, yeah. what's next? So, you know, we, we, we're often getting approached by uh, private equity firms and other organizations saying, we want to buy your business. And, uh, Obviously, this is something that's happening a lot. We have our own acquisitive strategy. We did three deals last year. And, um, we're very active with uh, several deals now. So the one thing that uh, sort of for me, as far as what's next and is already taking place is, I think it's really important for our community, being the MSP community, to deeply understand the private equity space. Over 60 private equity firms over the last five years have entered the space 
and are, are, are looking to be part of the consolidation here. That is, and I can share, you know, uh, with anybody who ever wants to reach out to me, I can share some data on this. This is a very, very significant economic force. So it, what we are doing right now as a leadership team and as in my role, I'm deeply understanding the private equity dynamic and particularly the private equity dynamic that is focused on our space because there's two, two pieces to it. One, that is who we are going to be competing with. So let's at least deeply understand our competitors or that's who we're going to be partnering with to make the most of the consolidation opportunity that is happening. And I believe what is next for NetSure, I think there's an opportunity to, to do a consolidation that is by MSPs for MSPs, but leveraging private equity for good. That's, that's what's in my mind right now. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask as a follow up. Do you feel you're you're still learning private equity, or have you mastered like have you mastered? Where are you on that portion of the journey? No, I feel I definitely feel I'm still learning, uh, but I've uh, I, 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 it, it literally started with uh, Orit Kadesh's book, and I read that a few years back called Lessons uh, from Private Equity for CEOs. More of an essay. I think it's about 100 pages. You can read it in a Saturday morning. Uh, and then there are various other books that I've read, and uh, we actually probably the one Dave that, that that was I suddenly got it was Adam Kofi's book, um, the Private Equity Playbook, and then his other one Exit Playbook. So so we partnered with Adam, and uh, he's helping us. He led he did fifty eight acquisitions over a twenty year period. He led three PE back platforms, uh, not in our space, but and so. I'm just drinking from the fire hose, learning from him. Uh, so I don't think we're there yet, but I'm definitely uh, learning and growing. And I feel I feel I can quite confidently have uh, a discussion in that space. And also, I think it's great if if you are considering selling your business and you're talking to a private equity firm to be able to have that discussion with some level of sophistication and understanding. Uh, I want to want to ask because I feel like it's the appropriate one. What's what's next for you personally? Because you're you're open about that, and you're, yes. what's, what's in your dream book that's next personally? No, so I'm I, I'm a very active and present dad. Uh, my daughter's two and a half, and uh, I, I, to be honest, I don't think I've ever been as present as I have been since she's born, which which just remains a a, a huge focus. I, I think. Um, you know, with some of the stuff I've shared with you, I've had some probably the toughest year of, of family loss ever. And uh, so I, I, I just suddenly the importance of family is just uh, really, uh, it's never been so amplified. And I, I yeah, I, I think just from a, from a, I mean, I've been doing this since, I've been doing this full time since 1997. I'm having more fun now and enjoying it more than I ever have. That doesn't mean we don't have challenges. We've got tons of challenges. So, uh, yeah, this is, continuing doing what I'm doing right now is definitely a big part of what's next. Uh. Well, there is no better sentiment to end on than that one. So, Oren, thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. And if anybody in the audience wants to reach out and, and have a discussion, uh, and the, some of the things we've spoken about, uh, yeah, feel free to reach through it. You can connect with me on LinkedIn or you can text me if you want. I'm happy to share my, my mobile number. Thanks for your time and attention. Time is a finite resource, and I really value you giving me some of yours. If you like this video, you can let me know with a like of the video and even more valuable, hitting the subscription button. My content is all free and I use metrics like subscriptions to pay the bills, so it has real value. The content here is produced under ethics guidelines posted at businessof.tech. If you're interested in more content like this, you can get access to content early via our Patreon at patreon.com slash MSP radio. It's our give what you want model where you set the value of what you think the content is worth. If you like this podcast, you can catch it daily as the five-minute news and commentary show, The Business of Tech, available on all your favorite podcatchers with links at businessof.tech. Just hit that big blue button to subscribe. 
Again, thank you for taking time out of your day to listen, and I really value the interaction. If you want to say something in the comments, I do respond and watch all that, and I look forward to talking to you next time.